So as we know that uh, the cataract surgery is nowadays a, a premium surgery and uh, we need to give hematropia to all of the patients. And if we consider the, uh, the topography or the, the quantum of astigmatism, we practically see that practically 30% of the patients, they have uh, astigmatism either of one diopter or more than one diopter. So with the advent of uh, this historic IOL, uh, we are able to give our best results to the patients, making them hematrop. And this is what basically is needed and uh, acquired from the patients. They demand that they must see the clear vision with the, without glasses. So this is how this uh, program is designed to give you a little insight of toric IOL. Apart from me, we have got Dr. Zishan. He's a eminent uh, young dynamic uh, surgeon from Jammu. Dr. Rakesh Shakya, the prolific surgeon from Chitrakoot, the biggest eye hospital in Asia. Dr. O.P. Agarwal from Indore. Uh, myself from Bhopal and Dr. Harvansh Lal, who is our Vice President and already holds so many of posts in uh, AIOS from Delhi, and Dr. Rajiv Chaudhary, the prolific surgeon and high volume surgeons from Indore. So without wasting much of time, may I ask Dr. Zishan to kindly go ahead and uh, may I ask our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Uh, Sagarika, to kindly join us on dais with uh, Dr. Rakesh and Dr. Chaudhary. Please. Dr. Zishan. Yeah. So, good morning, everyone. So I'll just give a, a basic outline of what is astigmatism and what are the various machines that we use to calculate our uh, major astigmatism. So modern cataract and refractive surgery aims not only to improve vision, but to provide a good unaided visual acuity. It is more of a refractive surgery. Now you need to give a patient six by six, even if he has pre existing astigmatism, um, correcting astigmatic errors and control of surgically induced astigmatism are now an integral part of such proce uh, operative procedures. So technological innovations and surgical developments in recent times have provided new methods for correcting uh, astigmatism. So what is astigmatism? So uh, it basically means it's an optical condition of a non accommodating eye in which light rays from an object, they do not focus uh, on a single point because of variations in the curvature of the cornea or lens at different meridians. Instead, there are a set of two focal lines. So when you talk about astigmatism, it is uh, comprises of the three parts. So there's something called as anterior corneal astigmatism and which uh, the second one is posterior co uh, corneal astigmatism, which is kind of very important recently. And the third one is lenticular astigmatism. So lenticular astigmatism on an average composes of uh, 0.5 diopters on an average. So most of the astigmatism is anterior corneal astigmatism and posterior corneal astigmatism. So total corneal astigmatism is a summation of anterior uh, corneal astigmatism and posterior. Coming to corneal astigmatism, so we have this broad uh, classification as regular astigmatism and irregular astigmatism. Regular astigmatism, the principal corneal or the, or the lenticular meridians of astigmatism or axis, which are 90 degree to the meridians, have constant orientation at every point across the pupil. And the amount of astigmatism is that same at every point. And these can be corrected by the spheroslender spectacle lenses. Regular astigmatism can be classified with the rule astigmatism, against the rule astigmatism and oblique astigmatism. So in, with the rule astigmatism, the vertical cor uh, coronal meridian is the steepest and it resembles an American football lying on its side and a correcting plus slender axis should be used at or near 90 degree more common in children in against the rule astigmatism the horizontal meridian is steepest and which resembles a football standing on its end and a correcting plus slender axis should be used at or near 180 degree and it is more common in older adults oblique astigmatism is kind of regular astigmatism in which the principal meridians they do not lie at or close to 90 degree 
or 180 degree but instead lie near 45 or 135 degrees so these are the various topographic images of the regular astigmatism in which you can see the first images with the rule astigmatism the vertical meridians are steeper and in the second uh, the horizontal meridians are steeper the warmer colors there uh, against the rule astigmatism and the third one is oblique astigmatism so this is another classification which is used uh, based on the position of the image uh, in relation to the retina which is simple myopic astigmatism compound myopic astigmatism simple hyperopic astigmatism compound hyperopic astigmatism and mixed astig astigmatism so in the simple myopic astig astigmatism one of the uh, focal points is at the retina and one of is uh, um, above the uh, ahead of the retina and in compound myopic astigmatism uh, if both the focal lines they lie in front of the retina it's called as compound myopic astigmatism in simple hyperopic astigmatism if in, in unaccommodated state one focal line lies behind the retina and other is on the retina in compound hyper hyperopic astigmatism both the focal lines lie behind the retina and in mixed at astigmatism in an unaccommodated state one focal lies uh, line lies in front of the retina and the other one behind it so coming on to irregular astigmatism so instead of the two per, uh, principal meridians there are multiple meridians which are inclined to each other at various angles it is usually acquired and pathological so these are the various causes of irregular astigmatism like keratoconus which is most important pterygium limbal dermoids corneal pastes ectasias dermatoceles corneal vascularization multiple foreign bodies and keratoplasty so the most important part of irregular astigmatism is while you're doing refraction any refraction which is inconsistent with the uncorrected visual equity you have to think about this patient's going to have irregular astigmatism especially with very high cylindrical uh, retinoscopy or uh, even auto ref uh, auto refraction when you're doing so streak retinoscopy also demonstrates irregular scissoring in patients with irregular astigmatism these are not usually accurately corrected by the spheroslender and loss of spectacle best corrected vision but preservation of vision with the use of a uh, uh, gas permeable contact lens coupled with topographic corneal ir irregularity that is how most of we come to a diagnosis of irregular astigmatism so this is a patient of keratoconus in the right eye which shows a topographic map uh, basically it's a pentagram map of irregular astigmatism when you, where you can see the posterior float and the anterior float uh, in the posterior float you see warmer colors and anything above uh, 18 i think is considered as keratoconus so coming to lenticular astigmatism it is best uh, treated by removal of the lens and toric iuls completely remove it um, so now coming on to the diagnosis of uh, corneal uh, astigmatism so these are the various ways we can uh, diagnose uh, astigmatism includes keratometry auto refractometer uh, retinoscopy, monoocular subjective refraction, including Jackson Cross Lender, corneal topography, corneal tomography, ocular biometry, and the recent OptiWave refractive analysis O system. So, keratometry is still used. It only measures the anterior corneal uh, curvature in the central 3 millimeter uh, radius. The placido disc based corneal topography also studies the anterior surface of the cornea, and it's one of the first machines to uh, study uh, the topography uh, of the cornea the warmer the color is ever seen the more steeper the surface of the cornea um, so tomographies while topographies look at the surface tomographies look beyond the surface and the current tomographies they are based on uh, their elevation based and they are mostly of three types slit scan sky flug and high resolution anterior segment OCTs so slit scan with the op scan one and two and sky flug with the pentagram the current ones in the Galilee so op scan it combines two technologies that is advanced placido uh, disk based system and the calibrated video with scanning slit beam so it gives you a chord map basically and the curvature maps the elevation maps which are direct data from the scanning slit which represents two corneal shape and elevation data compared against a reference surface uh, usually spherical and also a patchymetry uh, map so these are the quad map in an op scan which gives the anterior float posterior float the keratometry readings and the patchymetry then on uh, the current uh, tomographs that are used are pentacam or uh, scanflug based imaging tomographs so pentacam and galilee 
um, both have uh, shine plug imaging in one both are uh, rotating and in one there is a static in pentacam there is a static a scan flux camera and the other one is the rotating scan flux uh, camera so they produce high resolution images and they measure true elevation points very accurately so for measuring the posterior coronal astigmatism uh, these are the uh, ones which are like the best as com even compared to the op scan so um, so the uh, optical bio uh, biometers that is the iol master 700 and all so they they what they do is they have something called as telecentric keratometry which uh, measures the anterior uh, coronal surface and the swept source oct which measures the posterior coronal surface and they to uh, give a total keratometry which help in uh, measuring the total uh, astigmatism so an i will power uh, calculation done with a cylindrical power of 1.5 at 19 uh, 100 190 degrees this so the new technology like opti wave refractive analysis system ors they are interoperative wavefront tabulometers and they provide real time refracted information so it's usually done in a fake phase when uh, the uh, cataract has all been removed and then gives a, a fringe patterns which provide information about the spherical cylindrical and axis components of the refractive error so this is how it looks like and uh, interoperatively only this uh, gives you a accurate i will uh, number with toric lens i will number as well thank you thank you dr rishan for giving a good insight of keratometric reading with the different gadgets we'll take up the question at the end of session now i invite uh, dr rakesh shakya to just go into the next sequence how to calculate the power for toric i will Yes, yes, please. So, uh, as we have said that I, uh, I will must be seven hundred incorporate the posterior corneal curvature. So, with that, if you are incorporate for a toric eye selection, you are uh, using the Barrett. Uh, would it have some discrepancy because the Barrett formula also take into account some posterior corneal curvature and. Actually, uh, the posterior curvature always is the plus. So I think that you always take the anterior posterior curvature both, because uh, initially they say that uh, the uh, anterior uh, posterior curvature is constant, but but nowadays in the posterior in the Barrett formula they are the both surface at uh, will take. Yeah. I'm asking is whether it is getting incorporated yes. twice, because I will yeah. consider it's taking into account by the swept source the posterior curvature and. You are putting that data into Barrett's to get the uh, where you place the lens of so, so that incorporates this constant posterior corneal curvature, yes. uh, assuming it's about point three or point five, whatever it is. So will it get? Uh, no, no uh, IL must have seven hundred will not take it because it itself is measuring the posterior corneal curvature, and then they are calculating. So it is incorporating actual posterior corneal curvature. Ha, exact, exact data, not double. What your question was? Ki, uh, so, you get, so you are using Iron Master. Yeah. You get the biometry. Yeah. And you uh, get the um, posterior corner K reading in. And and it, you are it, using uh, Barrett's. So whether it will get incorporated twice or not? No, no, no. Because it itself is measuring. Na? So they are taking actual value of the posterior corneal curvature. I I I understand his question because uh, Barrett itself is taking no standard uh, posterior corneal curvature and you are measuring actual corneal posterior corneal curvature. So you are uh, incorporating it is twice.
ओके मैटर गॉट क्लियर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सर सो गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल स्पेशली इंजनादी सन एंड एंड गिविंग द अपॉर्चुनिटी एंड एक्चुअली द प्रीवियस टॉक वॉज वेरी गुड सो द माय जॉब बिकम वेरी इजी बिकॉज दिस इज द वेरी डिफिकल्ट टॉपिक फॉर मी सो द माई टॉपिक एक्चुअली कंप्राइज ऑफ दिस हेडिंग सो देर इज नो फाइनेंशियल डिस्कलोजर so as you all know uh, actually the cataract surgery nowadays is the uh, refractive surgery so everyone want to keeping the patient is uh, uh, spectacle free so but the ro routine monofocal cataract surgery does not address the presbyopia intermediate vision astigmatism so so as you see the in the myopia and hyper uh, hy hyperopia can be corrected by the appropriate spherical aisles approximately by in the when we see the study approximately 20% of the cataract patient have the astigmatism of the 1.25 diopter 2 or more or 10% uh, uh, patient have the 2 diopter or more astigmatism in the preoperative in the actually picture so that the after the cataract surgery they are the sometimes uh, after the monofocal they are sometimes the uh, results are unsatisfied but the toric aisle is uh, also actually uh, remove the don cataract and astigmatism both so uh, management of the astigmatism open there are the few options uh, the spectacle contact lenses and uh, opposite uh, clear corneal uh, incision and uh, lri and astigmatic keratotomy laser refractive surgery and uh, toric aisle these are the highly accurate and predictable uh the upper part uh, upper the four uh, options are actually not accurate but the laser refractive surgery is accurate but they are uh, slightly more expensive and there are the few complications also so there are the few indication of the toric aisle uh, visual segment cataract corneal astigmatism regular astigmatism and correction of the astigmatism in the aisle plane so uh, there are the uh, actually uh, there are the many factor that are uh, uh, that are uh, responsible for the opt uh, optimum uh, outcome of the toric aisle like uh, uh, surgical induced astigmatism and preoperative evaluation is very important especially biometry and uh, uh, this the aisle calculation is uh, very important and uh, especially in the surgical steps also medical surgical steps also very important and uh, removal of the visco from behind the lens is also important and the rotation of aisle also important so there are the uh, the component of the uh, uh, this the toric aisle calculation the axial length keratometry the three different devices manual keratometry automated keratometry topography and surgical induced astigmatism and aisle power calculation so uh, in the keratometry the steep and flap magnitude is 90 uh, degree apart multiple measurements should be taken key reading of the two separate devices to match and key reading not to vary more than uh, 0.5 diopter so we take the uh, minimum two major point with the different principles and it should be not mismatch or it should be repeatable if there are any mismatch uh, toric aisle not should be done so every incision can change the corneal curvature so there are the many factor affecting the corneal astigmatism the size of the incision location patient age sutures and vary from the patient to patient so uh, the surgical induced astigmatism should be actually calculated for the every surgeon in the separately so be precise about the axis and incision and location and uh, calculator or uh, the calculator auto calculate the si axis if the fill the uh, 20 to 30 cases in this calculator the posterior corneal astigmatism is the uh, uh, always the uh, against the rule astigmatism if the anti surface is the with the rule uh, astigmatism total astigmatism is slightly less so the threshold should be slightly uh, toric uh, threshold should be slightly increased and if the anti surface is the against the rule then total astigmatism more so the toric threshold should be decreased and there are the uh, posterior curvature uh, measurement can be done with the oct or pentagram and uh, uh, the bear norm gram that uh, actually determine the effective toric aisle population depending upon the effective lens position so aisle with the low power deep ac aisle with the 0.5 diopter or more torosity aisle with the high power or shallow ac aisle with the 0.5 or less torosity so axial length uh, uh, application uh, application as scan is not accurate so there are the two technique immersion and optical biometry is accurate but in the mature hypermature cataract the immersion technique uh, is accurate 
but in optical biometry the accurate but has the limitation in the dense cataract. So according to the short and the long eye, uh, these are formula uh, should be actually applied. And uh, corneal topography for the toric eye should be uh, avoided in the irregular astigmatism and rule out the other causes of astigmatism like scar and degeneration and ecclesia. And the toric eye calculator is ideal if the consider posterior uh, corneal astigmatism, surgical need to segment or effective lens power position. And there are the many uh, 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 calculator are available online and the uh, Elcon online calculators, or Acreol online calculator and Barrett formula. So initially we have to put the demographic details and then data is more important than the steep and flat axis, axis axial length, uh, surgical induced static medicine, incision location, lens thickness and wide to wide diameter. And data input the demo demographic details and keratometry, IL spherical equivalent, surgical induced static medicine, and uh, incision location. So data it output is the recomm uh, recommended ILS model, a spherical equivalent of the IL and amount of amount and excess of the residual astigmatism. So these are the online calculators available. So now that there are the many uh, new formula are actually uh, available the Barrett universal seconds. Uh, these are the all formula are in the experimental phase. I think it will come. And newer is the aura is the initially talk uh, the the intra uh, intraoperative abrametry. So this is the optimize the refraction analysis and real time IL calculation and estim estimate the total refraction. So regulation what to do actually regulation either after the toric IL. So manifest the refraction the plus or minus power enter the axis current toric IL calculate. So and they uh, actually uh, be calculate according to. So we conclude the, uh, the toric eye calculation it should be in the total corneal elastic medicine and regular elastic medicine topography and uh, appropriate eye formula should be applied uh, and ideal online calculator should be applied. Thank you, sir. Uh, can you ask some questions? Uh, please. So if you do the keratometry on uh, IOL master and lens star and you do keratometry on a pentagram, so how you compare and how you, which one you take as a more reliable? If there are there any regular estimate, then it's not reliable, I think. See, See the, should I answer? Okay. So there are two things in the, when you take a pentagram reading, it gives you the anterior surface as well as the total corneal power, which gives the combination of anterior and posterior both. So the, when you are comparing, compare anterior with the anterior. Do not try to compare posterior with the posterior to know whether there is agreement between the instruments or not. And secondly, but uh, when you take the astigmatism for correction, then take the total because it will take the posterior corneal curvature also into the count. For knowing whether your data is all right or not, so compare anterior with the anterior. Anterior also between two to three millimeter because in a pentacam, one millimeter will give you different axis, two millimeter will give you different axis and a volume, three millimeter will give different, four will give different. So when you are choosing the IUL, then you should choose according to the pupil size also. That means if the patient's pupil is small, take a smaller, usually two to three. Western data is okay. takes four millimeter. Is there another talk on this? So, so there's a Western data is usually on a four millimeter, which you should not take because Indian people's are little, is smaller as compared to the uh, Western people size. So compare and take the total uh, corneal power for calculation. And uh, whatever may be toric, I will calculate it. should apply your own mind because if the different uh, equipments are giving different readings, then you should think of what axis are you going to place. So pentacam axis will be usually more correct. And if there's a disagreement of the two axes, then treat the patient with steroids and lubricant eye draws for two weeks till your data gets aligned. Most of the time, the pitfall is dry eye, uneven corneal surface. Sometimes when oil master or you measure when the dilated pupil or undilated, so there will be a slight difference 
in the oil moisture's k-reading data or calculation. So best is to calculate on undiluted or normal pupil. And if you are measuring that with the oil moisture, there is a high astigmatism or some uh, unpredictable astigmatism, then you should definitely compare it with the topography. So, <coughs> so once uh, the main problem comes in the astigmatism, yes, sir. so that vary from 2 mm, as Dr. Harbans mentioned, it yes. vary with 2 mm. So ideally it is 2.5 to 3 mm for the Indian people and you should take it from the topography. Topography will give all the estimated amount from all the range because Oil master, whatever they fix, you know, 2.5, 3 mm, line star, whatever they fix, there is a fix, you cannot change. Topography, you can compare and then you can adjust that data. Sir, topography usually gives seem K and we want for the cataract the central most corneal curvature. At 3 mm. 3 mm. Central yeah. most, sir. Because, for example, very on, if you take 1.2, it measures. So it will be more steeper because cornea is steeper in the center and flatter in the periphery. So the keratometry varies in central point. As it goes periphery, yes, it becomes yes. more flatter and flatter. No, no, no. I, I think when you are comparing, you compare, like I told you, because your lens size is taking 2.5. On a pentagram, you compare 2 and 3. And particularly, axis, if you see at 1 millimeter, it is the total refraction which is important. It is not, when you are talking of the RK, irregular cornea is entirely different because there is a more flattening. In a regular cornea, Usually, pupil size should be your guide. That means pupil size is 2 millimeter. 2 millimeter will be <coughs> better than taking 1 millimeter because 1 millimeter is too small. And most of the time, what I have found, the axis acceptance with the refraction, and refraction is very, very crucial. What I am now noticing over a period of time, I didn't want to bring up this topic. Many patients I do not have a keratometric uh, astigmatism. But when I put on a normal monofocal, next day we find that patient has got a cylinder of 1.5. When I go back and analyze my data, patient was using actually spectral prescription on that. So why it is happening, I don't know. So the axis agreement with the spectral prescription, with the pentacam, and on the biometry. So if you get all of them, that means you are very, very dot on. But if there is a disagreement, then take reflection also into the account. What is the, when I'm finding there is a disagreement between the pentacam, and a biometer, then I look into the patient's refraction, what he's accepting on the refraction, then probably I'll give the weightage to the refraction and accordingly adjust what I want to do. So, Dr. Yes, Harbans, that, means, that means for a person who when you're cal calculating the toric IOL calculation, you're doing uh, calculation, you're putting that patient through so many things. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, normally we are doing it with just yeah. IOL master and then mm. determining. That means that means our results are probably inaccurate. I mean, thanks. I mean, that's great information. Yeah, yeah. Probably so if the uh, pa patient is hematropic and your topography is showing astigmatism, then you should definitely consider the topography because this astigmatism might have balanced by the lenticular astigmatism. Sir, topography usually gives SIMK values. It takes the average and it gives the SIMK. No, no, no. Uh, to no, no, no. Topography is a value when it gives one. It is a one millimeter diameter value. It does not take, when it gives a two, a two millimeter circle, what is the estimate? It does not give the total of zero to two. It gives the estimate at two millimeter. So it is not the sum of the, if you take a four, it is not sum of the zero to four. It is at four millimeter, what is the estimate? It is not the sum of all of yeah. them. So then why yeah. not the keratometry of the topography is accurate? Should be used in all the formulas? No, because the, the estimate is, like if you see the hill, so it's not the same. Apex, so so the, that's the reason in spite of sometimes totally haywired uh, toric IOL, and you get a very good results. Because the some point is getting corrected. If you see the RK patients, they have got so much distorted cornea, but still they are not complaining. Well, there, there is some point in the cornea which is focusing the image for him. So the, but we need to compare all the available instruments to be more sure and confident what we want to do. And always uh, promise a patient that the vision is best if your astigmatism is less than one diopter. 
So we do not promise zero. Yes. And this is very easy yes. target to achieve. And most of the time you will get 0.5 points and residual you will get, but most of the patients are very happy. Even if, and uh, I think uh, let's, this Sir, discussion we, will go on. So I think yes, since we are running late, and I request yeah. next uh, speaker to good morning. Patel is uh, talk. Good morning, everyone. I thank Dr. Vijay for giving me this opportunity. I am going to talk about different procedures to correct astigmatism and marking axis for toric IOL. So we are in the era of refractive cataract surgery. And for all of us, cataract surgery is becoming easier day by day. We are all trained for FACO and everything. But the result of cataract surgery must be equivalent to refractive surgery and which is the most difficult part of cataract surgery for all of us today. And in, in next 10 to 15 years, lot many patients of our refractive surgery, which we have already done in last 20 years, LASIK and everything, they are going to come to us for cataract surgery. So every day the cataract surgery, the surgery is much, much easier now. We all do. But the results, we have to aim for emetropia because all our patients know what the technique and technology is available. So we all must agree and adopt as early as possible for toric lenses, toric procedures, what is available uh, today. So time have changed now, not only to worry about surgical outcome, but also to worry about the post-operative -oper refractive outcome of all uh, our colleagues and all uh, cataract surgeons. This changing mindset of ours due to change in patient's expectations in today's era of cataract surgery force us to give total spectacle free vision to all our patients. So nowadays, before we were talking about treating astigmatism more than 1, 1.25. But today, corneal astigmatism of 0.5 diopter even we can treat we can easily treat without anything adding in our procedures. So approximately 30% of cataract patients have astigmatism that require treatment. We all know uh, how astigmatism uh, give difficulty in uh, patients' vision. The, these, these are the myths. Very few patients like in this group know. More than 30% of patients need this type of treatment need not to correct, we have to correct. Patients never demand. Now the patients are very demanding. This is costly procedure. There are very various things available and they are not very costly. We can correct by primary incision. All cannot be corrected, but few, definitely, that I am going to discuss. So what are the facts? We usually avoid. We don't take call that we can do, uh, we can treat astigmatism during cataract surgery. Uh, we don't do proper counseling of the patients. Fear of losing patient. I have that toric is so much money, patient will go somewhere else. This is in our mind. Less accustomed on correction procedures like toric IOL, LRI, even arcuate incision with uh, femto lasers. Lack of confidence on post-operative outcome. This is the most important thing which we all think in our mind. What Dr. Herbans class was uh, talking, we have to explain patients. Thoda sa rehega, but whatever we can reduce, we should. So these are the options available. Uh, other than optical corneal incision on steeper axis, this is what I want to express much more. That even 0.5 diopter of astigmatism we can treat during cataract surgery. Start taking incision at steeper axis. 2.2 incision, uh, do FACO, enlarge is 2.8 or 3 millimeter. We can at least reduce 0 0.5, 0 0.7 diopter of astigmatism for each and every patient of uh, cataract surgery. Limbal relaxing incisions, nowadays we don't uh, practice much of the limbal relaxing incisions, but toric IOL, smart toric IOL, I have uh, done 14.5 diopter of astigmatism for cataract surgery with this smart toric IOL. Flex available and then bioptics. These are all procedures available to all of us. So, uh, uh, but our first choice is always toric IOL. This is more predictable 
and better outcome is available now we have in our hand uh, femto laser which can correct the stigmatism during uh, cataract surgery with the help of arquette incisions so these are the corneal single incision uh, pair incision lri toric il arquette incision these are all available what is available what is patient's choice we can at least start treating uh, toric uh, uh, astigmatism in our cataract patients so this is about what the available uh, measures are for treating cataracts uh, in uh, cataract with astigmatism now what the tools are available to mark for toric il hamara sabse bada hitch ye hai कि हम उसे मार्किंग कैसे करें उसी कारण से हम लोग एडॉप्ट नहीं कर रहे हैं टोरी कायल इन अवर कैटरैक्ट सर्जरीज सो देर आर टूल्स अवेलेबल नाउ देर आर लॉट मेनी सॉफ्टवेयर्स आर अवेलेबल विच ऑटोमेटिकली कैन गिव टोरिक मार्किंग सो टोरी कायल्स नीड प्रॉपर अलाइनमेंट टू प्रोवाइड रिफ्रेक्टिव आउटकम इन कैटरैक्ट सर्जरी एंड वी हैव टूल्स एंड सॉफ्टवेयर सो दीज आर द टूल्स अवेलेबल वट वी नीड टू डू वी हैव टू डू two step marking one is reference marking and another is axis marking so for reference marking there are uh, different uh, markers available and for axis marking the uh, the mendes ring and toric marker set is available so what are the current gaps in uh, toric marking pre operative reference mark we need three marks 5 degree 3 to 5 degree off here and there will uh, change the results thick marks up to 3% uh, 3 degree or thin marks also gives uh, uh, different results implantation axis over pre op reference marks so these are the current gaps so what are the solutions uh, basic tor toric marking needs two step marking reference marking and axis marking reference marking we need three marks 3 9 and 6 o'clock and then we have to take the patient in operation theater and we do axis marking that is incision location and less lens uh, placement one for incision and two marks for lens implantation if we want to avoid this two step marking we have instruments equipments in our own setup by which we can do reference mark uh, we can do incision location and uh, implantation of uh, lens only this three marking in sitting position why we need this two to avoid effect of cyclotorsion of eyeball in lying down position uh, we need two step but we definitely can do with the help of slit lamp so simple slit lamp in our opd can give excellent results equivalent to even varion isko axis of slit beam can be adjusted according to requirement of toric marking this can be done from 0 to 180 degree after installation of paracan ask the patient to sit upright in position and after painting the sinski hook with the help of marker pen adjust the slit beam and directly mark single point now we have to mark two points 180 degree apart for toric lens implantation these are the two marks this is how we can mark two points 180 degree apart for placement of the lens this is the axis marks for toric iol placement post operative patient in this patient even on first post op day we can confirm the placement of the iol in the bag and we can confirm the exact axis of the lens implanted in the bag this is the technique by which we can confirm the stability of the lens in post operative period 
to see the rotational stability thank you so this is how we can mark only three points in sitting position uh, now the lot of uh, softwares are available for toric marking like varion and callisto dr op kindly conclude yeah so i am not going in the detail of all these things so this is by the help of varion we can uh, mark in sitting position and the same will uh, transfer to our uh, microscope in the operation theater and uh, we can uh, have hardly 30 seconds i'll take ek video chala do so we can take the incision at steeper axis with the help of this varion image guided system and lens is all implanted in desired axis with this image guided system thank you thank you very thank much thank you dr op for uh, giving a nice talk thank you both now i invite dr nishlani to speak on surgical tips for the toric eye on kar good morning everyone so i am just going to give you a little uh, idea about the surgical tips that maybe in the beginning one must follow and uh, later on can refine by its own strategology to come to a good results so toric iol surgery is basically a uh, a learning curve which requires little of time dedication and observation of the results that you carry on um, each and every patient has to be analyzed that what has happened and what more has to be improved upon uh, target hematopia lot many things have been discussed the important issue like we were discussing that 3 mm zone is the ideal zone to calculate the k reading and that has to be a consistent k reading check any uh, abrasion or may be compared with the topographer if it is available but it's not always mandatory that you can have a 3 mm zone k reading with your auto refractometer keep on doing cases and try to assess the things what exactly is going on dry eye disorders they keep on changing the keratometry so always put a lubricating eye drop and try to see that the two or three readings are practically similar optical and immersion biometry has been stressed upon and the newer generation formally which are very important check and recheck the data feed it in software do it by your own maybe if uh, your uh, paramedical staff is doing he might be putting axes here and there the surgical induced astigmatism and take a proper print out check it sign it and stick in your ot so that you never uh, going to miss anything and uh, um uh, you are definitely on the target counseling of these patients is very important because you in the in the beginning might be getting little bit of surprises so to evaluate surprises and to make it uh, more refined the counseling is very important no one is i mean say uh, 100% perfect because uh, human eye is a is a biological thing it's not like a computer uh some preoperative invasive uh, uh, examination the important are pupillary dilated in uh, examination the pseudo exfoliation zonular weakness or any retinal pathology because you need to give a clear hematopic 66 vision this already has been discussed but nowadays with the practice i have been i mean say uh, doing more of a free hand marking you ask a patient put a num um, uh, barakin eye drop ask him to look straight ahead and with the free hand marking you just do a three marks 
180 degree apart and 90 degree. So this makes practically the things easy. But initially in the beginning you need to take a help of gadgets and keep refining. Finally you will come to this stage when you can do all this freehand marking. And this is practically equally good that we um, find in our results. Now the important thing is the capsular axis. So just for the beginners, what exactly is important, take a ring, make a mark of 5 millimeter, or you can simply take a caliper of 5 millimeter, mark a central point of a, your reflex. So that will give you an idea that this is the limit of a capsular axis. So this capsular axis definitely going to cover the IOL and not going to keep the edge of our IOL free of the axis. This is what important, particularly in toric IOL to make it stabilize longer in its axis to give you the best results. So this could be practiced in the beginning, but later when you get more accustomed, definitely you can go ahead with the, the way you like and uh, you can definitely um, uh, uh, take a proper diameter of a capsular axis which is around 5 millimeter. Now what more has to be observed in these cases, uh, you get different variety of uh, density of the cataract, it could be a soft cataract, it could be a hard cataract. Use your best method of doing FICO, you are accustomed with. So. It should be, I mean, say like a normal FICO. The only thing you have taken uh, axis where the IOL has to be aligned and the reference marking has to be good. Rest, everything is practically same as a normal FICO. So never hesitate to do a uh, toric IOL in a way that it, it, it is, it is a, a, a kind of fear for you. It, it has to be done in a normal FICO these markings has to be very perfect. So like this is a little bit harder cataract, the align, um, uh, the axis reference marking and the alignment axis has been marked and I usually sitting on a head of a patient, I usually take around 110 or 120 degree of uh, my incision always try to protect the endothelium because you need to give a good clear cornea post-operative, next post-operative day. So these viscodispersive agents are one of the good thing. The care has to be taken, you should not stress to the zonules, should not give any stress. If at all there's a zonulolysis or there's a zonular deficit while doing a FACO, you can definitely implant a CTR and simultaneously a safe implantation of IOL is all mandatory. It should not be with any jerks. It should not press too hard to the back. The normal way which you doing in a normal FACO. The only thing finally comes with uh, uh, a kind of alignment of uh, IOL to uh, access required as far as the calculation or according to the calculation which has been done. Like in this case, this has been here somewhere around 80 or 75 degree of uh, um, placement. Remove viscoelastic behind the IOL, which is very important because you need to um, 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 make this IOL fix and adhere to the posterior cap. So this is very important. One can use a bubble on top of IOL after aligning it so that it remain pressed with the posterior capsule. The other thing which is to be avoided is a hypotony. The hypotony is, if at all is there, it can allow IOL to rotate in the back. So these are the few tips which definitely has to be taken care of. And to move IOL in a axis of alignment while the irrigation aspiration is going on, one can take uh, advantage of uh, this second instrument and can bring it to this, the axis of alignment. So this could be, leave it just around five to 10 degree before of that axis of alignment and then finally you can do it. So these were the few surgical tips I just wanted to share with all of you, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Now I invite Dr. Harvan Slal, our Vice President for the Tori Coil for Irregular Cornea. So I thank Dr. Vijay Nichlani for giving me this opportunity. And uh, dear friends, like as we know that the demand for the Tori Coil is rising. And we there are a lot of patients who have got a corneal astigmatism or irregular corneal astigmatism. Those who need to be corrected upon. So there are many causes of uh, irregular corneal astigmatism, but what we need to know whether the pathology is progressive or non-progressive. Of course, you cannot put a toric IV in a progressive pathology. If it is a non-progressive, is he a contact lens user, contact lens user or not? Any contact lens user, you cannot use the toric IUL because contact lens covers the aspirin is better than any toric IUL can cover. So I'll be taking radial keratotomy as a prototype and how radial keratotomy used to work was we used to give a radial incision with the pressure of the IOP, the paracentral area will go up and central area will flatten. But unfortunate part of this is that this hypropic shift keeps on happening throughout the life. That's the reason the flattest corneal median is in the center most area and we are not able to measure that area. This is where the error comes from. And then these incisions causes irregular astigmatism. So I'll just give you two, three case scenarios. This was a 51 year old male with the RK 15 years back with the refraction of minus four, minus 3.5 at 170 degree. And once on an optical biometer, also you will see the astigmatism is same, more or less on the same axis, and the IOL power is coming 13.5. But if you see the pentacam, the cylindrical power is the same, but I, the keratometric values are a little more. So if you see this, if your target refraction is zero, and we, when you put on the IOL calc dot CRS dot arc, this is a very good software. It does nothing intelligent. It just gives you all the readings at one pace. If you put all the readings onto the IOL master, also you will get the same reading. So there is nothing extra intelligent, but it will give you all the formulas at one place. Now if you see over here, Pentacam is usually more accurate, gives you the flattest reading, but in this case, Pentacam is giving 39.5, while the biometer is giving 37.49. That's the reason the biometer is accurate, but Pentacam reading is not accurate. And I always target minus one. So when we target minus one, this, then you will find that what we need the IOL is a 15 adapter. And this 15 adapter is okay because the patient has got a refraction in minus. Most of the patients of RKI usually when they come to we are they using plus glasses. If they are using plus glasses, then this reading is absolutely wrong. Because myopic patient will need little lower than 21 adapter, hyperopic patient will need little more than 21 adapter. So this is the another prototype of a patient. You will see over here 6.25 adapter asymmetries and you see the biometry reading is 21. And on the pentacam, and this when we calculate on both of them, I will calc dot ARCRS, the target refraction zero, we get a pentacam reading, uh, the power was 27.49 and on a biometer it was 21. And once we put on a minus one, then it is 29. So now see the gap from 21 it goes to 29. And if you see the lens star reading was 36.61, which were much more steeper than the pentacam reading, which was 32.5, which was four diopter flatter. So in this case, we'll take a pentacam reading, calculate the maximum, whatever formula is, whatever you are getting the maximum IOL power, target minus one. So we went on with the 29 diopter of IOL. And so far as the, what axis should be used. So the biometer is giving axis of 172, pentacam 145, but irregular, whenever there is a corneal irregular, refraction, refraction is more reliable than pentacam and biometer both. So in this case, refractive error was at 164 degree, we targeted for 164 degree. So all irregular cornea, refraction of the astigmatism is more important than your pentacam or a biometer reading. So we went according to the refractive error. This is the another case scenario, 32 incisions. And you will notice that in this, the IOL power was coming 10.5. When we went and calculated an IOL calc, this was in my initial case when I didn't realize where the mistake was. Even targeting minus was coming something 11.52, we, we went for 12.5. And this post-operative patient had the undilated AR of 13.5 and plus 1.5. Acceptance was plus 9 with plus 4.5. You can see the amount of error. I mean, IOL calc, 
maximum minus one targeted still the error was to this tune so we went and uh, did the iul exchange after one month and we put on a 27 iul still patient was plus 0.5 so then we tried to analyze why it is not still zero while we are putting so much prevalence so normally optical biometer when you see the reading over there one change in the iul power changes the refraction by 0 0.66 0 0.67 Two third of the effect you get. You see any optical biometer reading over here. Like if you see 11 is minus 0.02, if you put on a 12, patient will become minus 0.68. So nearly two third ratio is there if you see the optical biometer. So in this case, it would have taken that into the consideration. Though then 9 plus 4.5, 11.25 is the spherical equivalent. One and a half times 17. Add this 17 into the 12.5, which we have already used. Probably patient needed 29.5, not 27. So probably if we had to use around 29, 29.5 patient would have been better off. In the case four, the IOL power between uh, the, when we calculated was coming plus two and minus six. So this was absolutely here why it is not possible. So we did the absolutely simple cataract section and went and the patient had post of restriction of plus 13. We went and implanted 26 day after of IOL. So the, uh, what I would like to emphasize that the take flattest keratometric value available on any of the equipment. Calculate an IOCALC ASCS.R. Target refraction between minus 0.5 to minus 2, depending upon the distortion of the cornea. Any keratometric value above 40, that means you are measuring the actatic area. You are not measuring the flattest area. The error where we had, there the, the steepest, there was one axis was at 46 diopter. So we didn't take into that account. Any biometric IOL power, if you are using less than 18 biometric value is coming. If the patient is not myopic, if the patient is hypropic, probably you are wrong. So, and most of these patients need IOL power around 24, 28. So if the IOL power is coming less than that, you have got to be very, very careful. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Arvind Shlal. Now I invite Dr. Rajiv Chaudhary, sir, to kindly speak on post-op surprises and repositioning of Tori Kail. Sir, we are running late by... Okay. Um, I will take uh, minutes, hardly five we minutes. We have got a keynote address of Dr. Sagarika as well after you. Good afternoon. Uh, once with all the uh, things you are taken into consideration, enable, enable. Many times you have the surprises because of the, either you have done the wrong calculation or the IOL has got rotated. So once you have this post-operative surprise, an ideal thing is to recheck this location of the toric marking, what you have done and where you have placed on the discharge card, is basically mentioned that you have places 90, 40, 45 degrees. So very next day, post-operative uh, day, you can confirm it on the slit limb. So correct significant astigmatism in, is very important thing for the toric IOL. Proper alignment of IOL is a crucial part of the toric IOL implantation, which give profound impact on so you have to exact your surgical induced astigmatism, preoperative evaluation, you just recheck, calculate where you have aligned it and what is the at present current position. 
So what we hope, or so OP has discussed already that you can confirm in the set lane by manual method, digital, whatever you have done. These are the way of to align. Once you see that already it is there, you can check these are the how you have aligned. Replace this lens. If you have the post-operative surprise, again you have to recheck your all data. Again, corneal astigmatism, oil retention, and what is the effect? It's you have if there is a more than 10 degree rotation, you have one third loss of the toric correction. 20 degree, two third loss of toric correction. 30 degree is a total loss of toric correction. You have seen that many times your oil calculation formula, different model for the same patient. Two diopter, three diopter, which slight rotation because they come in the power one diopter, two diopter, three diopter, and if you have the toric astigmatism between that, they give slightly rotation. That they are reducing the effective power of that toric or so that you can have the correct so they are taking the advantage of this misalignment so once you suspect unexpected residual error especially in mixed test them reposition bring the visual re result always calculate the benefit of re-rotation even if the oil is on the axis Sometimes you calculate an oil in the, on the axis and there is a possibility that by reduce, uh, rotating you can correct more of the refraction. Now, when to return? Outcome are best if the surgeon waits for a week because for first, second day, if you are calculating there is slight corneal edema, wound edema, that astigmatism calculation may not be accurate. So apart from around the one week, the wound edema and everything is subtle. More than that, there is a chances of the fibrosis and rotation might be difficult. So it is best to between one to two weeks. I prefer to do it in the first week. How you can determine by the this slit lamp, you can just confirm whether you have placed the lens as exact proper axis or not. Then you can use the advantage of the iTRIS. It gives exactly how much rotation this power is required and how much rotation will going to correct your astigmatism. There are different online application which give how much you should rotate your particular lens. This is the eye trace give the exactly what are the patient actually feeling with this misaligned oil and how much correction you can. These are the astigmatism. And with the help of the eye trace you can exactly judge and by rotation post rotating how much correction you can achieve. This is the again another pre rotation. Then after rotation, the astigmatism and the aberration is quite reduced. This is a case, just I fast forward, a patient already because of the misalignment. It's a, rotation is very simple. Just open your the wound. Again, mark. Lens is already there. It was just miscalculation. We have pressed it on the wrong axis. And because if you do in the one week, you can very easily rotate and again rip. So don't hesitate to rotate. It is very simple. And again, cross check that you are on the proper plane and you can correct your error what you are done. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary, sir, for uh, giving us idea regarding the surprises and the rotation and repositioning no. of the IOL. May I ask Dr. Sagrika, please, to go ahead with the keynote address. Hard, mature, white cataract. Flex is my choice. Keynote address. Keynote, second one. Yes. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to speak. I realize that we are all tired of listening, but just hear me out because this is something that we all come across. White, mature cataracts, we can't see anything at all. And then along with that, you can't see how hard the cataract is, how hard the nucleus is, and practically you can see nothing at all. The capsule becomes more fragile in these cases, especially if it's a young patient. There'll be leakage the moment you put something, you'll find that there's leakage of liquefied cortical matter. The capsule, is, capsule just runs, the capsule rexis just runs to the periphery. There's so much of high intraocular pressure, and there's degeneration sometimes of this anterior capsule. You've got calcium deposits over there. And as I said, you don't know how hard is your nucleus. And remember that whenever you're doing a hard nucleus, you require much greater phaco power, more time. There can also be residual posterior capsular opacification. Now, we all explain to the patient. We give a good amount of counseling to the patient. But, you know, the patient's expectations are way, I mean, way beyond what you have reasoned. You have explained, but has the patient really understood? Does he understand that this kind of surgery is not easy? That this kind of surgery is really not what we normally do? Therefore, white cataracts in a young patient have their own special difficulties. And is it the type of surgery we have been performing all the time? Now, the important thing is that we want to give our patient the best and safest and most precise surgery. We all have sleepless nights especially when we have a young patient. He may be a slight myope. He's got a white cataract. We know all the things that can happen. Will our excess split open or run away? Will our cornea, because if it's a hard cataract, cornea remain clear? How much of vision the patient is going to have? Will the cataract also be leathery, so you can't break it, you can't separate it? You know, so many things keeping on and on, troubling your head. And along with that, so your heart rate, your adrenaline, your anxiety levels are all very high. Your hands are trembling when you're doing all normal surgery, which you're practically doing. These are normal things, absolutely normal. And the unfortunate thing is, add to that, is the state of affairs in our country. You do your best for the patient, but the patient is ready to come along and hit you. You wear a coat of armor also, coat of armor, no use. So now you have a dense white cataract, no idea what the capsule, uh, nucleus, hard, hard, uh, uh, the nuclear sclerosis is like. You've done your OCT, now your docking comes. Once you do a nice docking, what do you find? You can come to know by the OCT how hard is your cataract, right? And therefore, you also are able to lessen a decrease of your adrenaline rush by putting the offset in the correct position. And so, I'm sorry. And so you have this docking which gives you a lot more of information See, we have just reset the posterior offset, and we've come to know that this is not really a hard cataract. This is a young myope who came along to us with an absolutely white cataract. Therefore, the most important thing, which is the major surgical challenge in these type of patients, is to get an adequately sized continuous CCT. And therefore, we do not want in any circumstance the Argentinian flag sign, and therefore we say, oh my God, what do we do? So we can conquer this most important step by doing a flax. Remember, your dread reflex is also being compromised because of poor visualization of the anterior capsule. And therefore, a particular study has been done in RP Center by, uh, by uh, Dr. Vanathi, et cetera. Then now they found, you can just see the differences in the capsule rexis of a flax versus a manual one. Mind you that sometimes you may also have tags in a flax, uh, when you've done a flax incision, and you know, the lots of cortical matter is just beneath the anterior capsule, so that also might cause problems to you. So a major source in IOL power calculation is what? Which is the effective lens position, inaccuracy, uh, inaccuracy. Now, flax produces a more precise, reproducible, better centered, stronger opening in the anterior capsule than the conventional CCC. Mind you, a conventional CCC has a very round rexus also because in a cap, in when you're doing a flax, you've got small, small points which you're trying to break off. So therefore, it may be a nice round one which you see, but actually histopathologically, if you look at it, it may not be that round. Along with that, the important thing is you get a very improved overlap of the anterior capsule by the IOL, which produces a less IOL tilt and decentration compared to a manual CCC. So the capsulotomy process is more predictable, consistent size, shape with means of flax, but all is not good. 
Flux capsulotomy has its own set of problems. You can have incomplete capsulotomy, micro adhesions, and you can also have lots of extensions. Now, suppose you've got especially a silicon filled oil. One case report has been reported in literature where you find that there was an incomplete, uh, here you, can, uh, you can show this, see this one, there was an incomplete rexis, there was also an incomplete fragmentation. So you have to be careful about these things. Now, therefore, you search, what are the causes of tears? What kind of preventive measures can you take? So if you find that there's a tilt while you're doing your docking, even a 7.5 degrees tilt is ready that to cause an incomplete capsulotomy pattern. Redock if there's significant tilting. So you have to be careful with the patient from day, from top, from the time one that the patient is there for your flax. Extent of eye tilt induced incomplete capsulotomy is usually large, often located in the superior area. All, we, all of us find a patient just rotates the eye upward because of the of Bell's phenomenon. Always try to see that the eye is nice and wet. So give one drop of 0.3% sodium hyaluronate on the operated eye to wash away all the ocular secretions. Many of us do not realize that the patient has mebomitis and a lot of secretions are present over there. This facilitates suction, uh, suctioning, uh, suction before the talking. And also try to squeeze away all the air bubbles and ocular secretions. So this is, again, um, a very small, I, I always feel, why not have a wonderful rexis? Because half your battle is won. And so you, once you do the rexis, then whatever method you want to do, you've got a very, very hard cataract, and therefore you can do sculpting or you can do, a, and then once you do one sculpting and break one piece, and after that you go ahead and do your chopping, and therefore the you know pieces of pizza, they just separate, it and, uh, separate out and how comfortable that is for you. Along with that, with the flax, remember there's softening of the hard cataract. That also, therefore, it reduces your phaco time and diminishes also the risk of posterior capsular or passive, I mean, complications and endothelial injury also. Now we learn from our masters, and this is none other than from Singapore. The uh, lady says that I would give intravenous mannitol 30 minutes preoperatively, minimize specular pressure, speculum pressure. If capsular fibrosis is present in such a case, I would prefer a flax incision. And what if our patient has all the features of diving into complications, but also wants a premium IOL? Now, we want a 5 to 5.5 millimeter perfectly round centered capsule rexis is a preferred choice for a premium IOLs. So if you've got a right size, right size of capsule rexis, it completely covers up the optic of the IOLs, lets the IOLs center with the visual axis, you get the best visual results. Your patient is happy and you too are happy. So of course the capsule rexis will depend upon different IOLs designs. We're not going into that. Capsu the precise size will be customized with femtosecond lasers available. And this also leads to less intraoperative intraocular aberration. We have already talked about the uh, advantage of using flax for also one, up to 1.5 uh, uh, 1.5, uh, this thing of astigmatism. So that also is good. Now suppose, let's say for example, you've done everything, but you get a PCR. Now, therefore, now you've got a perfect rim. You do a little bit of your good vitrectomy and along with your maybe your VR colleague, and then this perfect rim of capsule allows you to place a, uh, allows you to place your IOL, maybe a, that is a three uh, uh, this thing uh, piece IOL over there. Therefore, you don't even need to put a glued IOL or scleral fixated IOL. You get back very good vision, less handling of the eye. Of course, there is less inflammation. Don't forget, all of us have our indemnity bonds over there. I didn't know what an indemnity bond was till I joined the civil. Uh, in the army, we don't have indemnity bonds. However, so in tales of, don't forget that there are huge amount of tales of medical negligence and everyone says we are apathetic. We are not. We try our level best, but there are some times when problems occur. Mind you, all of us are not from PGI, where consumer cases against medical, uh, for medical negligence was not taken up against PGI. We belong to corporate hospitals, oblique private hospitals, so we can have that done down our backs, so we don't know. Mind you, one person got back how much? When 1.2 million, I don't even number of zeros that are there in that million, because of patient being blinded in one eye. So let's not forget that this is a massive problem. So if you and I want to have a good waltz with our patient, let's choose, especially in this type of cases, I don't say in all, in this type of cases, choose the best, safest surgery, and therefore flax for such a case. Thank you for your patient here. Thank you, Dr. Sagarika, for enlightening us 
to use flax in uh, these hard mature cataracts. So we close our session here. I thank the panelists and the speakers who joined with me for this session. <coughs> Can we have a small photograph of our all the speakers and the um, uh, panelists as well? <coughs>